Okay, let's start. Welcome everyone to this webinar entitled Healthcare and ChatGPT. I am Maria Vasiloglu and will give you a very brief overview and introduction to the webinars in general and some housekeeping in order to run this webinar as efficient as possible. Uh, so, as as BIMPA, we are extremely delighted that we can organize these webinars as an extra service for our members. Uh, these webinars are organized by the special interest groups of uh, uh, SBIMPA. So our group is uh, e and m Health Working Group. You can see the full list of special interest groups and how to join them in our website. So today um, we are using uh, Zoom and this system you're all muted except for the speakers and organizers. This prevents noise and keeps us concentrated on the actual talk. However, we would like to give you the ability to interact with us, ask any questions that you would like or make comments. The organizers will aggregate the comments at the end of the talk and ask the questions of, uh, on behalf of the audience. Feel free to ask questions along the way, but remember that we will ask them only after the presentation. Also note that there is a full screen mode. Uh, if you click on this icon, you will enter that mode. So from our experience, this is the most convenient way of enjoying uh, this webinar. So today we are coping with a very interesting topic at ChatGPT. As you already probably know, this is an AI chat box, uh, which blends large language models and generates responses to user input. And it's designed to understand language, making it more useful for creating interactive applications. So computers have always raised amazing opportunities to expand the abilities of humans, but also at the same time, pose anticipated consequences. Uh, today, we are very happy that we have uh, Professor Marcel Salate with us uh, as a speaker. Professor Salate is a digital epidemiologist working at the interface of health and computer science. He received his PhD from ETH Zurich and conducted his postdoctoral research at Stanford University. He joined Penn State University in 2010 and is currently an associate professor at EPFL uh, in Switzerland, where he heads the digital epidemiology lab. Professor Salate is a pioneer in the field of artificial intelligence and its application in health, and he has authored numerous scientific papers and is an active member of several COVID-19 response teams in, in Switzerland. Welcome, Professor Salate. Uh, it's very nice to have you with us. Uh, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for for the uh, invitation. So it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I would also like to welcome everyone who's here. Um, as, as I mentioned briefly before um, the webinar started, I'm really looking forward to this conversation and I'd like to make it a conversation because frankly, I mean, you can be in this field for a long time, which just happened right in the past couple of months it has been a total surprise to everyone. And, um, and in, in, in a good and in a bad way, right? In a good way, of course, you now see the amazing opportunity in a bad way that it's, it's now very hard to, to predict sort of, you know, what, what does that mean? Um, and so we're trying to figure this out um, all together. And so th there's no point of me here lecturing for an hour. Um, although, of course, there's much to say, but there's much to discuss. And so I'm, I'm, I'm keeping my initial presentation here relatively short, also because I think the diversity in the audience is probably quite, quite substantial. Some people may have worked with artificial intelligence for many years. Others have um, just come across this in, in recent times and, and, um, and learned about ChatGPT essentially from the media. So We'll, we'll keep it relatively general and then we can go into the nitty gritty details in the discussion. So, okay, let's get started here. So what is ChatGPT and how does it work? I think pretty much everyone knows what ChatGPT is. Um, it's this model that was launched, I think at the end of November um, by OpenAI, a company in the US. And um, it's a, it's a so-called large language model. 
Um, what that means is that it's, it's a model that takes language as input and produces language as output. And um, essentially what these models do, and this sounds kind of silly, but it's nevertheless fundamentally correct. It's sort of a next word prediction. So the, the model takes a sequence of words or tokens as they call it, which are very close to words. And then it tries to figure out, right? It makes a prediction of what the next word will be in the next word will be in the next word will be. And for a long time, right, this, this approach has somewhat worked in the sense that right, these models have learned which words make sense together, which ones belong together, which ones occur more often than not. And so uh, some predictions, right, are, are very easy to make if I say, you know, COVID is an infectious, then you know, right, the next word is probably not going to be a car, but a disease. Um, but there are, of course, much more subtle uh, problems about this. And um, so early, early models were sort of doing okay on simple tasks, but, you know, they failed hilariously um, when it came to sort of more you know, real language, right, of multiple sentences. But the models kept getting better and better. They kept getting bigger and bigger, also importantly. Um, they, they started to be trained on more and more text, right? They need text to be trained on, just like image recognition models need images to be trained on. Those models needed text to be trained on. And um, now we're just over time, right, we've come to a stage where everything has come together. Uh, the technology, in the, the algorithm infrastructure is very powerful. It's called Transformer. It's, it's, it's the T in chat GPT at the end. This is a relatively new um, technology. It's published, the first paper on the Transformer architecture was published in 2017 by Google, notably. Um, and then the data, right? Uh, well, there's, there's the internet, right? Um, that now provides access to almost all of human knowledge. And then um, it, this is very expensive computationally, but now, right, we have the cloud infrastructure that makes this possible. You need a lot of money to do that. And, you know, OpenAI did have a lot of money, particularly also from Microsoft to do that, but it was very, very expensive to train that. But so now you have this, combination of these three things, right? The right technology in terms of the algorithm, the massive amount of data and the massive amount of compute power. And you bring this together and you get ChatGPT. And it turns out that um, this was actually, I think better than any, what anyone had predicted. So ChatGPT is based on um, a technology that was called that's called GPT, right? And GPT models have existed before, and it was GPT two, then it was GPT three, and this kept getting better and better, but it failed um, substantially, right? And at most tasks, and Chat GPT, the first version that was launched, was based on what is called GPT three five, and that seems to have been a real quantum jump, if you if you want to use that type of language, although no quantum computers involved here, right? where all of a sudden, well, the output made sense. It really was so consistent. It basically would, right, um, you know, any tur pass any Turing test um, where you just couldn't tell anymore is that really not written by a human. And then, right, just shockingly to many, I think just a few months later, uh, OpenAI released GPT-4, which again was a massive improvement. So gpt 3.5, the original chat GPT sort of was doing okay. And, you know, amazingly, it could even do some exams, but then not some others. And then GPT-4 comes along and it can basically do all exams and passes all of them across disciplines. So that is in a nutshell, right, what chat GPT is. I, I call it a calculator for words because that's what it is. You used to have um, numerical calculators, you would input numbers and you get numbers out. Of course, at the end of the day, right, even GPT technology is an algorithm. So ultimately, right, numbers go in and numbers uh, come out. But they are, words are translated into numbers and then they're uh, translated back the numbers into words. So from a user interface, right, you put in words and you get words out. And this works so well 
um, that we're now find ourselves in this situation that we're having to talk about this, what this means for things like healthcare. Good, next point. Um, so some obvious applications of chat GPT in healthcare, right, have been mentioned by many others. I, I concur with many of those. It, it, it depends, of course, a little bit who you talk to. So if you talk to physicians um, and people are really working, right, in the hospital or directly with patients, right, they will often tell you, well, they're excited, you know, for a kind of a decision support system or even simply, right, something like, um, you know, freeing yourself again from all the note taking that you have to do. This also depends a little bit where people are geographically. It seems to be particularly bad in the U.S. Uh, I've noticed just having spent a sabbatical in San Diego where, um, yeah, most doctors really complain quite uh, strongly, right, about the fact that they have almost no more time for their patients because they're doing all this busy work, taking notes and feeding the systems and filling out forms. And of course, if you now have a, a kind of a chat bot that, that could sort of do that for you, that can understand what you say and fill out those forms potentially correctly, right, that's, that could be a big deal. That's, that's a lot of the discussion that I'm seeing is around that, this whole notion that ChatGPT will finally free physicians from the burden of technology and make them healers again. And this is sort of the, the language that is being used. I think that's an interesting application and we can certainly talk about that. Um, one thing that is pretty obvious to me and I think to almost anyone is diagnosis. Um, I mean, you know, to put it provocatively, you could say, um, again, provocatively, a doctor is a kind of a chat GPT where you input a diagnosis and you output, right? Um, sorry, a description, right, of a, of a situation and you output the diagnosis um, and, uh, you know, with concrete action plan what to do. Now, obviously, you know, chat GPT is not there, but it's not um, unlikely, right, that we'll get to a point where for certain use cases, this can be done quite well. And we already know from pre-chat GPT technology that we're making headways um, for certain um, scenarios, right? Simple scenarios where that is possible. I think chat GPT and the GPT technology in general raises the bar and makes that possibly, um, uh, you know, will we'll make that possible for more complex scenarios as well. Another um, third big part where I see this play a huge role is actually in human engagement. And again, depending on who you talk to, people find this either incredibly depressing or incredibly exciting. Um, so the idea, right, that you could have a chat bot that actually talks to patients. Um, and on the one hand, right, you can say, what world are we going to live in, right, where machines talk to humans uh, because there are not enough humans around to do that. But then again, is that so bad, right? I mean, um, imagine, I mean, there are use cases that have been shown, uh, that have been discussed, right, where people really need a lot of engagement, almost constant engagement, um, Mental health could be one of the areas, right? Caring for the elderly could be another area where we simply don't have uh, the people that are there 24-7. Uh, and if a chatbot could at least support this for some time, but, you know, eventually maybe fully take over, this is something that, that, um, that excites people. Um, but again, I'm finding very diverse views on that from complete no-go to this is the future. Um, but this kind of engagement, of course, these are extreme examples, um, but I think many ways, right, we are truly now getting into the time where we have talking computers. Our entire interactions with computers in the past have been basically uh, visual user interfaces. Um, in the beginning of the our computer age, right? It wasn't even visual, right? It was just text um, uh, input. And then, you know, people invented the graphical user interface and that's the area that we live in now. 
you have graphical user interfaces and almost everything is based on that. And now we enter the area of um, uh, spoken or you know text, human text-based user interfaces, right? What, what Siri kind of promised and failed to deliver since 10 years, even today, um, is now really at the doorstep. And that is going to change a lot of things. Not only these extreme cases where somebody's going to talk to Siri or you know Siri GPT or whatever it will be called um, 12 hours a day, but also for your application, right? For example, I um, work with an application that helps people track their nutrition because I'm interested in personalized nutrition algorithms uh, that you know keep blood glucose levels low. So yeah, this works, right? We have the technology that this works, but of course, as all of you who work on those kinds of problems, for example, working on nutrition, know that it's really hard to keep people engaged in this kind of activity because it's just an app and the app doesn't really talk to them. And now that we get into a, a time where apps can actually talk to us and have conversations with us, um, I think that will dramatically increase what we can do with digital health because the engagement problem, which is one of the key problems in digital health, will essentially, well, I wouldn't, maybe dangerous to say it will go away, but it will certainly become um, something we can address. Um, a last uh, point that I would maybe mention is, um, is the, the sort of biomedical research type. Uh, we should never forget, right? We're now doing this with words that we find very useful uh, as humans. But language is not limited to us humans. Uh, you know, biology speaks its own language. Genes speak a language. Proteins speak a language. And we've already in the past have actually made quite some progress by using language models um, for, you know, things like protein uh, prediction and so on. And so I'm pretty sure um, this technology will, again, uh, boost that quite dramatically. And this will have, of course, implications uh, for healthcare as well. But I think that's not the main reason um, why people are here in this webinar. But it's, it's an area that, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't ignore. Good. Next slide. Um, so there's often, right, a large debate here with ChatGPT and people who have tried it, right, is that it's, it's not always correct. And this confuses people because we're used to machines being correct, right? We're used to the calculator type of model, uh, which, you know, when you input a sequence of numbers with a sequence of operators, it gives you a clear, verifiable result, and it's always correct. You know, why else would you build a machine? And now we have a machine that doesn't give you correct answers, right, all the time. It gives you sort of meaningful, sensible, convincing answers um, most of the time, but not all of the time, but they don't necessarily need to be correct. And that, for some applications, right, is a total catastrophe and almost makes the application, the technology, unusable. Um, you know, think of any application where the failure tolerance is just very, very small. I mean, whether that's, you know, a, a physician making a, a decision of life or, or death, uh, whether that's, you know, software you run in a self-driving car or in an airplane, right? You, you can't live with the fact that this is correct most of the time, right? Just, it's just not possible. Um, however, there's so many applications where it turns out you don't need to be correct all of the time, right? And indeed, one can argue we have entire branches of the economy where being correct is almost entirely irrelevant. Um, I mean, think of the entertainment industry, think of the um, marketing industry, I mean, where you even have questions of what does correct actually even mean, right? Um, and so in health, obviously, that's a little bit trickier because there we pride ourselves on the strong scientific basis and science is pretty much the, uh, yeah, the incorporation, right? The societal incorporation of, of uh, you know, correctness and, and factfulness. And, um, and so that 
that causes um, some concerns about what this technology could do. Um, and I, I share that, but then again, right, when I talk, when I think about things like engaging with patients, once again, um, is it really important that it is correct all the time? I'm not sure it is. Yes, of course, it shouldn't all of a sudden make suggestions about certain drugs to take, which the person shouldn't take. But many times, right, human conversations are very often not correct, right? I, I always say to people who tell me, oh, look, chat should be, I read it's a bullshit generator. I always tell them, um, well, you know, it turns out that most of human conversation has substantial elements of bullshit in them. And that's what makes it human at the end of the day. Um, we all have these hilarious moments, right, where we have been maybe speaking to a robot or to a bot that was always correct. And you cannot build a rapport with such a machine because it doesn't, it's just always correct, right? It's a calculator. Um, so, you know, the ability to bullshit actually depending on uh, how you look at it can actually be a strength for human engagement. Again, that you can consider that a very depressing view on humanity. Um, but I think it's a very realistic uh, view. Right? And by the way, I'm using here bullshit in the sense uh, that the philosopher Harry Frankfurt defined it, where you have the truth, right? And then you have lies and, and lie, a liar knows the truth. And his or her intention is really to conceal the truth. But then in the middle, you have the bullshitter and the bullshitter just simply doesn't care, right? It's just, it's just bullshit all the time. Some of it is correct. Some of it is not, but it's, it's convincing. And that's, of course, to a large extent, what ChatGPT does. But again, I would argue, right, that um, for a lot of human conversations on a day-to-day -day basis, um, there's a lot of bullshit involved. Good. Then uh, the last slide, I think it is the last slide before we open the discussion, because again, I, I, I'd really like to hear. So um, what I now would like to see going forward um, is, right, we, we should, and I guess we will be able to, we will be talking about the, the dangers of this also. Um, and that's very meaningful. And it's, it's something that currently uh, is, is very much in the media. Um, not at least because of this famous letter that was published um, that asked for a pause of, of research for six months. Um, but many people have, of course, raised ethical concerns about AI for many years. Now that topic is just on steroids because of the speed at which things are developing. And so, right, there's questions about how we should um, deal with this. So my view on this is I have two points here. Of course, I, my view is more complex than that, but those are the two that I want to share. The first is that um, I think from a medical perspective, right, we're, we're, we seem to be building a kind of a brain, right, that can, that can truly reflect the medical know-how that humans have developed over time. And that per se is, of course, an incredible achievement. In that case, right, it's just very questionable whether such power should be really in the hands of one or two entities, especially given that most of that knowledge, right, was generated by, by all of us, right, um, over, over many decades and generations and centuries. So I would love to see a standardized, openly available medical GPT model, right, that's, that's accessible to anyone um, and that is uh, fed right by by the best organizations around the world and perhaps you know spearheaded by uh, you know maybe the WHO or someone um, I don't know who but um, I would love to see this big push and not just you know everybody sort of running around the latest developments that's coming out of company A or company C um, all the time and these can be collaborations of course with the companies but I think that would be a sort of um, vision that I think a lot of people could could get behind, right? Because these these models also need to be fine tuned, and you need people to say, "Look, this is actually not the correct answers." And these are, of course, experts. 
Um, and I would rather give my expertise to such a model where I know this will then be useful um, for everyone else, um, you know, in, in society and not just to, to one company. So that's, that's one thing that I would like to see. Um, then the biggest concern that I have about um, AI and GPT now is, is not Skynet, right? I think um, those worries are, you know, we should talk about them, but I, I doubt they're imminent, although I think it's imminent that we certainly talk about this because it goes much faster than anyone uh, expected. And we can't just say artificial general intelligence is something for in 100 years, right? It's probably more likely in 10 to 20 years. So we need to be ready for this. But for the immediate future, my concern is much more um, about this sort of this famous saying about flooding the zone with bullshit, right? The, basically, we now have technology that can talk like us. And I really mean that, right? Okay, fine. At the moment, it's ChatGPT and it has a slightly clunky user interface um, in a browser, but it's absolutely no problem to turn that text into audio that you cannot distinguish from human audio anymore, right? And you can even uh, generate voices that sound exactly like Joe Rogan or myself, or, you know, you need some audio to train it, but then you can generate audio that is just um, really impossible to differentiate from real human. And so now I have an audio conversation, right? With something that makes sense most of the time. So in theory, this sounds good, but if misused, of course, that's truly hijacking our, our interhuman protocol, right? Which is language. And if we're not careful about this, right, then that could that could have uh, very serious consequences on the societal scale. And so what I would see there, right, is, is really strong legal uh, guidance that um, on the one hand, right, I, I always know whether I'm talking to a human or not, um, which I think there's good technical ways to do that. Um, and then on the other hand, right, that if something is generated by an AI, it's, it's always um, classified as such. That, that I think will be, will be important going forward. Of course, it's tricky because sometimes it's a mix of the two. And now how do you classify that? But we need urgent clarity also legally about, um, about how to do that. Good. Um, I thought I was going to be just 20 minutes, but it turned out to be 30. Um, in any case, I hope we have now a good half hour um, to to discuss, and I'm very looking forward to hear and read your questions. Great, thank you so much, Professor Salute. So we'll open the floor for questions. Uh, I am Mavra, I'm a chair of the Electronic and Mobile Health Special Interest Group at ISPINPA. And with me um, more moderating the questions is Amanda. Um, so I think we do have some questions, Amanda. Uh, on the Q&A, so I'll let you start those off. Yeah, so the, our first question is from Zinongian, who's also a member of the SIG. And he says, could you show us how you use ChatGPT in your nutrition project that you mentioned and how ChatGPT is integrated? Oh, okay. So I'm not using it yet, um, but so that's the plan, right? So th th this nutrition project basically has an app um, it's an image-based app, right? That people are asked to take pictures of what they um, of what they eat. Uh, you can go look that up. It's called My Food Repo. Um, and so, and so then we use AI, but image recognition AI, right, to then recognize what it is, and then there's a human in the loop that verifies this. So th this system works relatively well, and it's validated and so on. But you know, having used this system now on a on a cohort of over a thousand people. We've, of course, learned, right, that the, the, the key challenge is to keep people engaged if we tell them, look, please do this for 14 days while you have your glucose monitor on. They'll do it for 14 days if they know it's, 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 a, it's a good research project. But already after seven days, it gets, a little, um, it gets a little tiring, right? And then if you say, can you do this again for 14 days and then uh, again for 14 days, why would you want to do that? My thinking there is more that, you know, if we can now start to actually interact, right, with the user in a, in a sort of personal way um, where, where the GPT technology behind it could say, hey, you know, here are 
you know, seven things you ate um, in the past couple of days, right? And here's another recipe that's really good. And, and you know, and where, where the user could then even ask, you know, um, well, you know, that's, that's a lot, that seems to be a lot of fat, right? Is, is there, is there something like that, that doesn't have as much fat and, and then it generates new recipes. I mean, highly um, recommend everyone go play with chat GPT and ask for recipes, right? It, it's quite powerful, especially GPT-4 I've noticed is, 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 is super powerful. Um, and then, right, it's, of course, scientifically you have to be careful right because you obviously don't want to too strongly influence what people are doing when you're doing a kind of nutritional study but it really depends on what you're actually trying to study so it's more that kind of right engagement where the app could now talk um with the user right in a in a non-predetermined way um and that's i think it could potentially be a real game changer but we're just starting to explore that because the technology is so new Great, thank you so much. Um, so we'll move on to another question that's come up. Um, this question is from Laura Heckel. She says, would you mind sharing your opinion on having a moratorium on this development in order for laws and regulations to catch up with the technology? Yeah, yeah, I can share um, my opinion. So I, I will also say that I signed this letter when it came out. Um, I don't know if it worked because I still cannot see my signature on there, but I, I I do remember signing it, um, and I signed it not because per se I thought okay, half a month, a half a year is is a sufficient time, right, to sort out all these problems. I don't think anyone ever suggested that, and one can argue right whether that was whether that was the right call. I mean, when you call for a moratorium, right, basically you're saying, I think things are going too fast and we're losing control, right. That was the point um, to then say, uh, well, you cannot solve this in six or three or nine months is a, is a little bit beside the point, right? The point is that is, is this technology really at the stage where we can just let it loose on everyone? And, and you find very different um, points of view about this, right? Many people, of course, when you're critical about technology, then you're often, uh, then you're immediately a Luddite, right? And people immediately say, well, you know, they wanted to stop computers, they wanted to stop the radio, they wanted to stop everything, right? They wanted to stop video games. And it just never works and it never makes any sense. And at the end of the day, well, technology is like a knife, right? You can certainly slit, slit open a throat, but you can also use it for really good things. And I agree in principle with that. But on the other hand, you know, knives don't develop knives, right? I mean, to me, the biggest issue here is that this is a technology that 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 um, can develop itself to a certain extent, right? And that can improve its, its own um, uh, capacity. And when, and so the speed at which things are now happening, right, is absolutely incredible. I mean, even just two years ago, you could write an opinion piece somewhere right in the New York Times and warn of the impending um, AI winter, by which people mean, right, nobody's going to be interested in your AI anymore. It's all hype. I mean, even today, people use hype, right, when they talk about ChatGPT. And I'm like, which part about the word hype do I not understand, right? Because for me, hype means overinflated expectations. And if anything was the case, right, in this case, Everybody had completely underinflated expectations about how fast this technology is moving ahead. And so, right, to sort of say, well, why don't we take a break and think about this um, for some time doesn't strike me as a terrible idea. Notably, right, the letter said, um, you know, research on models stronger than GPT-4. That also strikes me as reasonable, right? We have we have an, an enough we have enough wonderful innovation that we can do with GPT four like technology for the next ten years, right? Um, even if the even if the, all the development for new technology would stop now, so I'm in principle sympathetic um, to it, um, even though I see, of course, that it, it's somewhat hard to put the cat into the bag again especially because there's just now also all of these open source models. And of course you can tell 
you know, open AI to take down chat GPT, but you cannot uh, tell the open source models, right, to go back. So it will be challenging. But to me, the letter reached its goal in that now the entire world, right, is talking about whether that's a good thing or not. And um, I think there will be regulation. And it makes a lot of sense if you think about it, right? I like nuclear technology. I like CRISPR. I like gene editing, right? I think these are amazing things that we humans discovered. Do I want everybody to have access to that through a web interface? No, I don't, <laughs> right? So I think it's actually relatively reasonable that we say, well, um, you know, maybe not everything that can be done on the web should be done in the web. I think we just, as a society, we haven't quite developed yet those antibodies. When it's digital, somehow everything goes, right? It's fine. It's just the genetic stuff and, and, and the nuclear stuff that's somehow crazy. But when it's digital, no, no, it's fine. And I think we're learning slowly and slowly, right? That that's probably not true anymore, right? These things are now so powerful I mean, it starts with this discussion about whether social media is actually kind of a health concern, right? Especially for, for um, adolescents. Um, that evidence is now coming up. And, and so possibly, right, that there has to be regulation about this. So I guess once again, right, we unfortunately need to have our big um, um, sort of accident almost, right, where, where AI will go really bad before, before we um, kick into action. Uh, I hope we're smarter than that, but, you know, if history is any guidance, um, I'm not so sure. So I, I support it. I think, I think um, uh, a more controlled, a slow down um, is, is not per se extremely bad. Um, I, I think it's, we need to this urgently discuss it. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Antonio Palmera, who's our executive director of ISPMPA. And it touches on the point you made about using GPT in conversations and medical conversations with patients. So he asks, do you know of studies that tested the accuracy of answers from GPT against healthcare experts? And if so, what are the average accuracy? And can you point to any groups that are looking into this? Yeah, um, I'm aware that some people are working on this. Um, I've seen some preprints, um, but I haven't yet seen or read in detail any, any peer reviewed papers that would have given me good answers about that. Given though the onslaught of activity in this space is entirely possible that I've missed that. So if, if anyone in the audience has that, um, please post them. At the moment, most of the things that I've seen are, are more sort of the pieces about what, what this could do. I, but I know for a fact, right, that people are um, now looking at this. And I, I've seen some uh, early comparisons already that were, that were quite good, but I don't think they, they were peer reviewed. And it, once again, right, it showed you the diversity of use cases where it worked just essentially perfectly and then use cases where it failed perfectly. And um, We'll have, but but I'm I'm as interested as in you um, in finding good published work on that as it comes out because it's coming out on a daily basis. Great, thanks, uh, Marcel. Um, so the next question is actually related to that, and it's it's something that I was also thinking about. This is from Damien in the audience, and the question is: My experience using GPT four extensively to help with software development is that it does occasionally hallucinate brackets and apologize profusely when I point out its errors, but generally it is incredibly useful. Do you think we will always have to double check the answer chat GPT gives? That is a great question. Um, and I'm struggling with this myself. Um, I mean, to, to make a very trivial example, as you probably can tell, right? English is not my first language. So when I write, um, now I find it incredibly useful, right, to go to ChatGPT and ask, you know, is this actually correct um, in terms of English? And I've noticed um, it somehow seems to be moody, right? At times it, it, it gives me like a complete rewrite and like, no, no, I, I don't want it, right? Like just, just fix the grammatical errors, right, if there are any. And other times it says, this is correct. It's so well structured, right? It's like, it makes me really feel good about. And then I say, are, are you sure? Are, are you saying there's not a single 
mistake in this text. And then it says, oh, I apologize, right? Upon closer inspection, I noticed these three issues. And it's really tricky, right? Like, why would it do that? I mean, I don't think anyone, anybody understands this. And of course, right, that same phenomenon applies to any, any situation where you point out an error. Um, well, that's great. You know the answer. But sometimes even just asking, are you sure, right? then it kind of becomes unsure. And now you, you don't know, right, where, where you stand. I mean, with English, of course, it's, it's a trivial example, like that there is, a, there is a correct answer at some point. But with other things, I find, it, I find it quite confusing how that works. There's also this, this notion that um, it's been shown, right, to give much better responses if you ask it to reason step by step. If you give it right a, a question, it will sometimes give you an answer. It will just fumble. If you say reason through this problem, right, also mathematical problems step by step, then somehow by chunking it up into chunks, it um, splitting it up into chunks, it will it will get better answers. So these are all things, right, that we're sort of trying to figure out. And again, there is no like. That's also part of the reason why I really want these, these large scale sort of standardized models because now I can do some tests, right? With ChatGPT, but then, you know, OpenAI may change ChatGPT tomorrow and not tell me anything about it. And then, you know, none of this will be re reproducible. I mean, already, right? In principle, none of the research that you do with ChatGPT is reproducible. And that's of course going to be a huge problem, uh, you know, going forward. To, um, but so it, it, just philosophically, I just, and practically, I find it quite interesting, right, to figure out how can we um, make sure we get, we get reproducible and really high, higher confidence answer from these models. But at the moment, it's very much a conversation. It's, it's strange. Thanks, Marcel. Just to elaborate on this point, and this is just something that I'm thinking about, you know, for children and adolescents. Um, so, so, you know, it's like, well, how do they develop new skills? Even when you take writing, for example, if I can tell Jad GPD, just write for me, then I'm like, I'm, am I actually learning anything? It's like when we were young, you know, yeah. we're like, why do we want to learn math? We have calculators, but it's, it's like that question comes up now. Why do we need to learn anything? We have Chad GPT. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this, this is a good question. And as you can imagine, right, uh, anyone who's working in any educational um, environment has this question front and center, right, all the time now. Um, you know, I'm, I'm teaching a class right now um, at DPFL on digital epidemiology. I have exercises, right? And um, when ChatGPT came out, right, of course, I tried it. And it would get most exercises correct, but it would make subtle mistakes. And I was really happy, right? Because I was like, okay, this is how I can figure out, right, whether they cheat or not. Then GPT-4 came out and no everything was correct right just everything even the subtleties so now i've essentially given up on that and i actively encourage right the students and say okay right as you sort of start to um engage with this content right and start to start to sort of you know solve these problems you know try to use chat gpt as a tutor right and and try to figure it out obviously if you just put in the question and then take the answer, yes, that's correct, right? But when the exam time comes around, no more chat GPT around to help you, right? So don't be stupid. And I think that's, that's something we just have to teach, um, right? I have, I have children, you know, at school age, teenage, and I'm telling them the same, right? I mean, you know, to learn, I mean, use this right now, you have a tutor. Um, but um, if you do your exams um, with, if you, if you just uh, tell it to give you the answer, right? Then when the exam times comes around, you you will fail and then you only have one person to blame, right? And they, of course, they get that, right? Now, will they heed the advice when they're on the stress, right? And, oh, you know, the sun is shining and they rather want to go out and play football uh, rather than um, take care of this homework that's due tomorrow? That's another question. But in principle, I think people will um, will come around to the fact that there, this actually prevents them from learning relatively quickly. I'm actually really curious to see this at DPFL, 
to see if we will see an effect right now. This is the first semester where students could in principle fool themselves and then get the bill right um, during the exam. And that, that could be a big shock for the system. I'm thinking that the students are smart enough to realize that they would be sabotaging themselves. So I'm not so concerned, but it will be interesting to see how long it takes the system to adjust to it. Thanks, Marcel. Yeah, I think it's the idea is really in the future, not just the future, like even now to educate everyone about ChatGPT and its limitations yeah. to a certain extent and what it can and cannot do for us. What I would like to do is actually pass it on to Antonio, who, who's playing around with ChatGPT. Antonio, do you want to just uh, highlight that example you were just doing right now? Thanks. Yes, it was related to my question regarding the accuracy. And I was asking ChatGPT 3.5, not ChatGPT 4, and it provided me an answer. But then it made, just made up one reference that doesn't exist. So I don't believe what he has said uh, about the accuracy. Uh, so you yeah. do need to double check and triple check. Yep. Yeah. But, but um, so that's also interesting. That's actually the first thing that I did when ChatGPT came out, right? I said, okay, give me five um, key publications in digital epidemiology, right? Just to see, right? Because it's an area I know well, and, you know, and so this was hilarious, right? The first version of ChatGPT generated five um, references that were totally meaningful, right? There were authors that I recognized, the titles made sense, the journals made sense. The problem is none of it exists, right? Mm -hmm. The authors existed, um, of course, right? They were just names that it had used, but the journals didn't exist and these papers didn't exist. But, you know, it gave like years, right? And edition and page numbers. It, it so, I the, mean, you... The DOI, the digital exactly. object identifier, so you can, you just... It even it gives you a DOI, right? Yeah. So there There's I thought, no, okay, uh oh we have a problem, right? Because if, if I had asked this about quantum mechanics, right, I would have been fooled totally. Um, I knew it, right? Because I knew these people and I, I, I know the journals and I see these journal names, they don't exist. Um, then with ChatGPT4, now I have to say, right, if I do this again, um, it gives me 99% correct and good um, papers. It sometimes fumbles the, the last author and again I think that has to do with next work prediction where because it doesn't do a lookup right it literally does next work prediction and so it gets the first authors correct but then dot 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 and the last author is, is sometimes not correct but but it's the correct paper it's it makes a one-page summary that's correct the DOI is correct and the link is correct and so that to me was a bit of a sort of be careful type of moment, right? When I know a lot of the conversation where people are walking around are based on their experiences with 3.5, which may already have been something that's almost entirely solved, right? By, by GPT-4. So, so chat GPT being wrong, I think it's, it's, it's a very important topic, but we shouldn't use it as, a, as an argument to say this technology is going nowhere because and that's not what you wanted but just as an example um that that this this things are moving very very quickly we have a few minutes left so be sure to get your final questions into the chat box and peggy spurl asks will the gap between tech savvies and digital illiterates be even bigger with chat gpt because you'll have a group that will use it to their advantage and then a group that would be left out and then potentially fall behind career-wise. So how do we make sure everyone profits from the new technology? Yeah, this is a great point. I'm really, really concerned about this. I mean, I've been, um, I've been involved in, in activities here, you know, for many, many years about sort of running around and telling people you really have to up your digital skills or, or the future will be challenging for you, right? And of course, now that's just done again on steroids um, at the level that we haven't seen before, right? D people have now this wrong, this wrong perception. They say, oh, wait, I have seen ChatGPT create code, right? You say, please make this and this, and it outputs the correct code. Yes, that's correct. But the conclusion that now you don't need to learn code is completely wrong, right? Um, 
I mean, I'm following some people, you know, on social media that are experimenting with this. And of course, I'm experimenting myself. I actually this morning wrote a little program that that takes an audio file, you know, something that I say to the computer and it it um, it then sends it then translates it into um, text and then sends it to ChatGPT. So basically, I just built a little program that allows me to talk to ChatGPT literally. And I built this within an hour and I built it, you know, because I basically asked ChatGPT, right, um, and helped me to build it. But of course, I had to know quite a few things already, right? Um, I had to know about, you know, servers and frameworks and post requests and HTML. And I mean, the technology you still need to know. Yes, you now don't need to remember all the libraries and, and learn uh, many different languages necessarily. But the prompt that you're giving to the tool, right, to basically ask the right question um, still requires you to understand what's going on. In the same way that a doctor, right, a physician will be able to ask really intelligent questions to ChatGPT that a patient won't be able to ask because they don't have, even have the background to know what should they actually ask, right? What's the right question to ask? And if you think about it in programming, it has always been like this. In the early days, right, we literally created punch cards. Then eventually, right, uh, people started to develop uh, programming languages. They looked really weird. Um, and then over time, they, they looked more and more like English, right? And then you had things like for, in, and do, while. Um, and now we're just, we're just at the next level, right, of abstraction, where we can now say almost perfect English sentences to, to chat GPT. Um, but but those can't just be language that we use in our everyday language, right? Those need to be highly informed about the technical frameworks and about the code that you're trying to reproduce. And then you can use this to your advantage. And then it really makes you crazy productive all of a sudden. And that's, of course, a danger, right? So now the people that already have this background knowledge, okay, they can now jump, right? Factor uh, 10 or 100 with this tool. And those who don't, they, they can't do that. So I'm really worried about this increased um, inequality between you know, having technological competences and not having them. Um, I'm not sure what to do about it than just telling people it's really important, important you get on board with tech. Um, on the other hand, right, um, if you look at the long term, you can argue you know, my wife's a winemaker. I mean, her job is safe, right? <laughs> so, right, when you look at all of these analyses of, um, of uh, you know, jobs that are safe from AI, right, it's all, it's all stuff you do by hand, right, um, and not the kind of knowledge work that we do. So, I, I don't know. I don't know yet, right, where this is going to go. But certainly, if you have technological competences, this this just brings you to the next level. I'd like to ask a question. Um, so there are many ethical considerations around ChatGPT. You mentioned before the example of the students in the classroom, which might be easier to control compared to the scientists that might use ChatGPT to write scientific papers, for example. <laughs> Um, yes. So I'd like your opinion about that. And also, mm -hmm. uh, which is a bit linked to it, your example that my support from Chatbox, from ChatGPT might be provided to the elderly or people who live with mental diseases. Again, how ethical is this? Yeah. Wondering. Yeah. Well, okay. So maybe this the second part, because it's a little easier. I mean, once you're doing this in, the, in any medical context, right? Um, well, right now you have a fairly solid ethical framework, which still applies. Right. And, you know, thank goodness. Right. Um, and we see, I think we've seen some, some people learning this the hard way, right? Because they built some chat pots and did some experiments with mental health patients without getting an IRB and so on, right? So that's obviously going to end bad, badly. Um, but then, right, if, if you do this in a, in a responsible way um, uh, with the usual constraints of, of ethical um, frameworks, then, you know, I think then it's just another tool that you, that you can test and you must test it very, very carefully. 
Um, with your question about what about researchers writing papers, um, you know, there, um, strangely, I'm not so concerned. I think because ChatGPT has basically lowered the barrier, right, for producing text. Um, I think the role of gatekeepers will become even more important, right? The role of peer review will become even more important. Um, and whether people use ChatGPT to write it or not, to me, honestly, I find it a little bit less of an urgent question. It's the same, right? If, if, um, if I send you an email, um, do you care whether I wrote it with ChatGPT or not? What you care about is, do I stand behind this, right? Is this really Marcel who sends me this message? Um, that's what you really care about. Um, and so, right, that this goes back to what I said earlier about this notion of finding, proving our digital identities will just become so much more important now, right? Because basically you have to assume everything is fake, right? Whether it's text, whether it's video, everything can just now be created at a level that you cannot distinguish from fake anymore. And so it becomes very important for me to have confidence in, oh, this message is from Maria, right? This message is from Antonio. I can trust that, right? Whether you use ChatGPT, whether you, whether you use another software that helped you, you know, I mean, who hasn't used DeepL, right, to translate? Um, you know, I use it all the time, right, to translate into French. It's, it's not so important, right? The important thing is, do you stand behind what is written? And then, right, if you produce a paper with the help of ChatGPT and the content is interesting, peer reviewers think it's interesting, um, and you say, look, I mean, I'm going to put my name uh, behind this and this is going to go with my name in the permanent record, and I'm happy with that, then I, I have a hard time feeling very bad about this. Um, but it maybe begs a little bit the question, right? How will the peer review system now deal with, with the fact that people could in principle submit 200 papers a year, right? I think it was already a bit the problem before, but now this is going to be on steroids. And we now finally have to fact that we are producing too much, pay, too many papers, right? And the system wants us to do that. But now if we keep doing that and we start using chat GPT, then the system will collapse, right? Because people will essentially say, we can't peer review anymore it's too much so there we have to find other uh, good solutions great so we are uh, we have one minute left um we would like to thank you so much for the fruitful discussions and the great inputs uh the webinar will be available online also for future uh, views uh, so thank you very much, everyone, and especially Professor Salate, Amanda, Antonio, and Mavra. Um, have a nice evening, morning, day, depending on your uh, world stamp. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>